I have the great pleasure of introducing our speaker tonight, Dr. Julia Yamalt. I probably messed it up, I'm sorry. Speaking on autobiographical fiction. Um, she's going to discuss autobiographical fiction, including her work in progress for the sake of a necklace. And she'll um, pre um, preface this with a brief overview of Snow, a novel by Orhan Pamuk. Oh, good. <laughs> the 2006 Nobel Prize for Literature recipient. Julia, a native of Ankara, Turkey, is a senior lecturer in German, Comparative Literature Studies, and Turkish at Penn State. She has published an article, The Imagined Exile, Orhan Pamuk and his novel, Snow as well as academic books and articles on the influence of the Islamic East upon the 19th and 20th century German literature through Anatolian Sufism. Sufism? Sufism. Sufism. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for coming uh, against the competition that we have downstairs. I really appreciate you all trying to uh, find more uh, participants. So, I appreciate that. I would like to thank, of course, Mark and uh, uh, Sally in absentia for invitation, for encouragement, for the publicity. Thank you, Greg. Thank you, Zoe, wherever you are tonight, um, for uh, putting my face, actually, under the article here. So, um, well, uh, I would like to start without further ado. Uh, again, my thanks uh, to people, to whoever, whomever, I, whosever names I may have forgotten. I apologize in advance. So, when uh, Mark first invited me to give a talk, actually, this is what I had conceived of my talk's content tonight, uh, because I had just uh, worked on, a, on an article that is finally in print after editing. You know, so it has been tested, approved, and in print, so I thought there was no speculation, not much, or at least not much room for speculation after all, it's in print once it's that. The academics really tend to relax a little bit. So anyway, so my basis for tonight's talk is imagined exile or how novel snow. Um, but my talk, um, actually I gave two to my uh, presentation tonight for all of you. I, uh, you, I have given a different title and that is autobiography or fiction. And my talk will be twofold tonight and about half of the uh, presentation will focus on snow by Orhan Pamuk, an established writer, as you have heard Karen in, uh, in her kind introduction. Uh, a Nobel uh, Prize for Literature uh, uh, recipient is the imagined exile, as I claim him to be in his scenario. And then, of course, for the sake of a necklace in tinier print, I hope you noticed that because uh, I really uh, did not conceive this talk to be about my work, which is uh, in the truest sense uh, of the two terms, rough and draft. So uh, bear with me, a work in progress, and I call myself the imagined writer. Um, I think for appropriate reasons that you will decide at the end of my talk. Uh, my bibliographical sources here that you also have on the handout are strictly uh, for my talk tonight. So for the paper, there is much more, as you can imagine. Now, talking about the handouts, I have given you a copy of um, a handout because Sally thankfully told me to back up everything. So I have a USB, I have a burn CD, I have my webmail, um, you know, email uh, with my presentation and my paper for um, hard copies. Uh, but the reason uh, that I'm mentioning the handout is this. Please be forewarned in case you study the individual slides very, very, very carefully. I had a little bit of time in my hands uh, as a full-time teaching faculty. It is rare and it's astonishing. But I had it, and I modified some of my work in there. So very mi minor or modest modifications, but you may just say, oh my god, wait a minute, this is plagiarism. Uh, I hope I got plagiarism myself. Before I get to Orhan Pamuk's um, uh, quotes on um, Orhan Pamuk, I would like to just read the page, approximately a page long. Uh, argument uh, that I have made in that article that I mentioned since this is deriving from that article. Uh, a chaotic and ambiguous process of transitioning between the compelling sources of his inspiration 
unravels the numerous transformations of Orhan Pamuk's identity that he develops within the framework of metaphorical displacement, retransforming his protagonist into exilic consciousness. He capitalizes on the immense capacity of the novelistic art in facilitating infinite venues of discourse for his literary reinvention. The agonizing obsession for self-distinction he shares with his posited author takes him as a condition of exilic existence, as I argue in my paper, onto different levels of his evolving identity. He blends into his narrator as himself, the real author, before the end of his novel. In this stage of his dual identity formation, desperately seeking self-representation and literary reinvention, Pamuk assumes as an outsider, and, excuse me, Pamuk assumes an outsider status as the trope for his artistic composition and system of imagery. As if to exhaust the dimensions of narrations within the within exilic autobiographies of Azadi Seyhan's outline, one of the scholars of my research for that paper, Pamuk's fictional autobiography of exile assumes the forms of personal testimony, a biography of ancestors and community, the diary of two cities, one of Turkey, the other in Germany, a polyvocal history, a meditation on love and metaphysics, and an unauthorized biography of the Turkish nation. Now, uh, a few uh, quotes from uh, Pamuk's uh, own uh, from Pamuk's public statements on literature, on the novel genre, and then on snow, and then on his protagonist, Ka, himself. As you can see here, I will cut uh, some of them uh, to a point where uh, the meaning hopefully won't be lost. You have it in your handout. Just to save us more time, hopefully, uh, maybe for a question and answer session uh, before we all uh, exit for the evening. Uh, he refers to great literature as our ability, or uh, as the representation of our ability to put ourselves in someone else's place. But Pamuk is far, far more complicated than this. So please do not take this as a face value with any surfaces. I represent myself in the form of the other. And for the novel, on the genre of the novel particularly, he uh, refers to the fact that he really most prefer to belong to the world of imagination. And he does, in Snow and as well as in his other novels. But what I would like you to particularly pay attention to is the last few uh, uh, lines that, he, uh, in the, that are that appearing in this book. To leave behind this boring, dreary, hope-shattering world we all know so well, and to escape into a second world that was deeper, richer, and more diverse. Hopefully I will be able to make the point clear as to his quest, which has been documented as being a lifelong quest for self-signification, re literary reinvention, just being a diverse character, hence attaining broadly. And here on his snow, uh, he's referring to uh, the, no the genre of the novel again. My aim here is not to relate how I came to write a novel called Snow. The subject that I'm coming to understand more clearly with each new day is, in my view, central to the art of the novel. And that will interest us directly, uh, those of us who are really trying to write a novel, or at least conceive of a novel uh, plot. The question of the other. The stranger, the enemy that resides inside each of our heads, or rather the question uh, of how to transform it. So yes, he says, one could define the novel as an art that allows the skilled practitioner to turn his own stories into stories about someone else. But this is just one aspect of the great and mesmerizing art that has entranced so many readers and inspired us writers for going on for 100 years. It was the other aspect that drew me to the streets of Frankfurt and Kars. Uh, Frankfurt being the German city, of course, you know, and Kars, uh, the uh, Turkey city that he focuses on, despite being from Istanbul. Namely, what is the other aspect that uh, Pamuk uh, uh, stresses here distinctly? The chance to write of others' lives as if they were my own. It is by doing this sort of novelistic research that novelists can begin to test the lines that mark off that other and in so doing, alter the boundaries of our own identities. 
please bear in mind or try to remember the last few lines that mark off that other and in so doing alter our own the boundaries of our own identities. That is very significant for my uh, for the first half of my talk. Then on his protagonist car, this is what he says in a public speech. Since my novel Snow was published, every time I set foot in the streets of Frankfurt, I felt the ghost of Ka, that's the name of his protagonist. The hero with whom I had more than a little in common. Hence, he doesn't deny that he has great many resemblances in every aspect of his life to his protagonist, Ka. Ka is an exile of a wealthy and highly educated Istanbul family. He's a secularist, discovers Sufism, Islamic mysticism, or spirituality. Or I should have said, Karen, thank you, you corrected after I said Sufism, <laughs> that's where the emphasis goes, I apologize. Achieves literary self-fulfillment in Turkey after long ruling years as an unsuccessful poet in Germany, hence a Turkish German poet, and that's in direct relation to the first half of my presentation. Orhan Pamuk is neither a force nor a voluntary, <coughs> but he is also of a wealthy and highly educated Istanbul family, a secularist, Nam, secularist and an advocate of secularism in Turkey, as, el as well as elsewhere. Seemingly, he, he discovers, or in, um, he discovers, actually, literally, Sufism in snow only. None of the other novels that I could detect uh, talk about or deal with Sufi imagery or form or content in any regard. Achieves literary self-fulfillment worldwide after long ruling years as a writer of no birthly significance, as his public speaking said. Now, the theoretical background uh, regarding my paper. I am not going to really uh, kill this to bits and pieces. Uh, I will only mention a few names in chronological order, and um, you have the summaries of uh, what, uh, how they relate, actually, to Pomo Snow. The concept of dualism, conceived by or conceptualized by Charles Baudelaire, uh, permanently inherent in the artists, so in other words, liberal arts in our field, the power of being simultaneously oneself and someone else is directly evident throughout Snow. Again, I have to cut this short because I have quite many slides to go over. So if there are any questions regarding any of these theoretical works uh, and they are blending into Snow, I would be happy to answer to the best of my ability. Um, but can I uh, guarantee that it will be all satisfactory to your uh, expectations. Then George Lucas, moving down, his theory of the novel is a literary form created out of the unreality of ambition and fantasy. Remember what I have said about Pamuk only a few minutes ago, or maybe a minute ago, the early minute ago, that this is his ambition and fantasy. He has always wanted to achieve or attain worldly significance. And we are talking about the unreal. He is neither in exile, neither in force or a voluntary exile, nor is he a diasporic writer of Germany or elsewhere. So there is this unreality of ambition and fantasy that he's incorporating into the snow. And that is uh, fascinating on one hand, but at the same time mind-boggling, uh, quite ambiguous uh, at many, many times during the readings of um, someone who gets surprised by him. So he really adopts the form of transcendental homelessness. He is an exile by choice through his imagination. He's an Imagine exile. Moving on to okay. Okay. Mikhail Bakhtin. Now, his theory on the dialogic imagination, or the so-called dialogized ambiguity in the novel, is highly critical for uh, the understanding of Orhan Pamuk's Snow. Uh, what he does, the double voice narrator. I have mentioned that very, very briefly, succinctly, that he is, um, uh, his narrator is Orhan, his protagonist is Ka. Before the novel ends, his novel ends, he transforms into or blends himself into both. He evolves into his protagonist, yet at the same time he is his positive author. So that's what we are talking about, the double voice that Mikhail Bakhtin has talked about when he referred to the novelistic theory. His theory of the, the novel uh, having uh, representative, be, uh, being representative of the dialogized ambiguity, the double voice narrator, the dialogic relationship between the novel's real author, the narrator, and imagined positive author. Theodore 
Theodore, Theodore Adorno. And uh, this is this particular um, information, uh, piece of information, is not directly relevant to Snow because it is against my argument in that article that I mentioned uh, to you. Uh, he's not, as far as I could detect for my, through my research and my editors agreed with me, he is not an intellectual exile. In other words, he does not have certain issues with Turkey and stands beside it and says, I am an intellectual exile. I will be forever an exile. But rather, what Edward Said derives from or draws from Theodore Adorno's uh, theory, the metaphorical exile, the theory of exile is power. Because that's how he attains the diversity he really intends to do or has had quest for his entire life, as his public statements say. So his outsider status is basically in the place of or is representative of the trope of artistic composition and system of imagery. Now these are the theorists. What I also argue in uh, my work on Pamuk Snow is um, I basically claim that there is an ambivalent plot of multiple negotiations between the following. His fictional letter of Abu He basically covets four writers, uh, one already long deceased, Nazim Hikmet, the true exile, ex um, uh, arguably, and I quote from Azadi Seyhan, one of my uh, researchers, my, sorry, one of the researchers, one of the scholars whose work I have used. Arguably the most acclaimed modern Turkish poet who died in Russian exile. And please do pay attention to the second part of the quote. Perhaps the single most powerful source in his, of inspiration for Turkish writers of Germany. Because the three in the list, Emine Sevgi Ustamar, Arif Tekinay, and Zafar Şenoca, are all Turkish German writers. In other words, writers of the Turkish diaspora in Germany that Orhan Pamuk covets in snow. So, um, specifically, uh, Nazim Hikmet's exilic existence, his humanistic stance, and his poetry of mourning, particularly. The poetic symbolism behind, behind his poetry of mourning is thoroughly and distinctly evident in Pamuk Snow. Particularly, I'm going to give you these points uh, in the next slide. Uh, sorry, I'm confusing you. Emine Sevgi another Turkish German writer, construction of ancestral biography through a Turkish and Kurdish cast. Pamuk covers that exactly. And if taken a nice weaving of Sufism into the genre of the novel, and finally the fashion of Jack's construction of unauthorized biography of the Turkish nation. Now, this is the uh, parallel, uh, one, one of the parallel. Uh, we don't have two hours, so I'm going to have this really, I have narrowed it down to this slide. Ka, the protagonist. Orhan, the positive author, and uh, in other words, the narrator. He's an author. So, and Orhan, the real author, and Nazan Hikmet, the real exile. This is what is happening in uh, Sunel, in a nutshell, in a really um, drafted nutshell. Poetry of Mori, that the phrase that I have mentioned in connection to Azadi Sehan scholarship before, is in Nazan's two widely quoted poems on laws of student lives in Turkey. Pamuk, the real author, designs identical pathos for Ka, his protagonist, who happens to witness a young student's execution style death. That's one of the most dramatic scenes in Sinan. It is captivating, um, it's a theatrical performance, it really takes your breath away, uh, as if any novel could take your breath away. Uh, he also designs a typical pathos for the students in the revolution on stage. This is a multi-chapter secularist play, again in Sinan. Uh, that's something I cannot emphasize enough. And finally, for Orhan, his narrator, namely the positive author, he also uh, designs pathos uh, in, because Orhan endures has execution style death again. So that image comes back, or the motif of execution style death from Nazim Hikmet's widely known two poems are repeated in soon. Then, of course, there are more minor resemblances, um, if I can call that in justifiable manner. The number of years in exile that Ka has is opposed to Nazim Hikmet. Identical. The state of homelessness inside Turkey. Identical. Complex negotiations that Ka uh, survives through on the platforms of or on social, political, religious, but also personal levels. An all-embracing love for the fellow human being. Remember, I said humanism stance or humanistic stance of Nazim Hikmet. That's what we see in Ka through Orhan Pamuk, through his narrator Orhan. A really complex relationship. And finally 
Nazmik makes unique fascination with Turkey's offerings in every aspect of the country uh, since he, had, he died in Russian exile at the age of 61. Uh, his last poems always refer to his homesickness and everything. That's what we see also uh, in Sunni. Now, Emine Sevgi Özdemir, Pamuk covets, I go directly to the point, and say Pamuk covets her in her following novels, specifically, not just in every work that she has done, but Emine Özdemir, Emine Sevgi Özdemir has written a novel, Life is a Caravansaray, has two doors, I came in one, I went out the other, Mother Tongue, and the courtyard in the mirror. In nine long chapters, Pamuk imitates in snow her, I mean, Sevgi Özdemar's landmark theatrical and performance-based writing style with an intense touch of parody, unique to her writing style, to a point of absurdity in the Brechtian sense of whose work Özdemar is widely, is a widely known devoted reflection unique within the Turkish-German context of literature. Uh, I'd like to invite you back to what I have read initially from uh, Pamuk's uh, public statements, namely, to leave behind this dreary, hope-shattering world we all know too well into a more colorful world, so don't quote me on that, that's not what he says, but to a more diverse world, namely the world of imagination, <coughs> succeeding step by step. Arif Tenkinan, a prominent Turkish writer known particularly for her Sufi novels, what we also refer to as Dervish novels. Uh, the Crying Pamek Grenade, very well known, highly translated, uh, award winning. Jakob und Jakob, uh, from her sh short story collection, uh, the, a, a Fire is uh, Burning in Me. Uh, again, a short story on Sufism. What does Pamuk do? He adapts her Sufi imagery, Alif Tekinai, that's a female novel, sorry, I said adapts her Tekinai Sufi imagery through his identical motif of the small book of poetry in Kaos and Orhams. In other words, Orhan Pamuk's protagonist as well as positive author, narrators, quest for distinct identity formation and establishment throughout the novel. It is identical. He imitates Pamuk in Snow, imitates her protagonist again in his grueling quest for self-fulfillment and agonizing obsession with self-distinction for Ka and Orhan. A few slides later, I will be showing you uh, a comparative account, giving you a comparative account between Pamuk's fictional and non-fictional statements so that you can follow step by step why I am saying agonizing obsession with self-distinction for himself. Because that is when his life set goal. Finally, Pamuk the real author blends into Orhan, his narrator. The positive author uh, is himself. The real author thus evolves into a dual identity of mystical proportions. Finally, Zafar Şenacak, the last writer in my list of uh, authors whom he, Turkish German authors, or just Turkish authors whom he, whose works he covets. Prominent Turkish German writer again. He has been especially, and in controversial terms, uh, known through his uh, novel Dangerous Relationships, uh, because this has been categorized as an unauthorized biography of the Turkish nation. Uh, this is not my self determination. Azade Seyhan in her book highlights what an autobiographical fiction, excuse me, what an autobiography of fiction or fictional autobiography <coughs> can represent, and this is one of them. So over several chapters again, not just one paragraph, not just one ch uh, page or one chapter, over multiple chapters, Pamuk recollects through Ka Turkey's, his, Turkey's history, as well presents a memory compilation of it, enabling his novel to emerge as a replica of Shenojak's dangerous relationships. He then reproduces, or he also reproduces, the Shenojak archetype in the frame of a very <coughs> vocal history into which ideal he factors in a Greek Armenian Turkish triangular affiliation in lieu of, in place of Shenojak's Jewish Turkish, uh, Jewish Armenian Turkish framework. That's the only difference. Now, uh, the promised uh, comparative or contrastive uh, accounts, a non fictional account first, Orhan Pamuk's, uh, of Orhan Pamuk's lifelong quest for worldly significance through literary reinvention. The plot says everything for itself, but I am going to read it anyway. I hope you're all bearing with me. When I was in my 20s and trying to find a publisher for my first novel, 
an eminent writer from the generation that came before me, once asked me in jest why I'd given up painting. Orhan Pamuk is known to have done uh, experimental painting before he started writing. Uh, my quote ended. A painting did not need to be translated. No one would ever translate a Turkish novel into another language. And even if someone did, no one living in a foreign country would be interested enough to read it. This is one of Orhan Pamuk's, the real author's public speeches. Don't take this the wrong way, Mr. Pamuk. Your book is beautiful. This is about another book, not snow. He presents it and he gets this reaction. But unfortunately, there is no interest in Turkish culture in our country. Like any young man who has been denied a position just because he was born in the wrong place, I found this depressing. But I knew they were right. I felt like some sort of demented intellectual banging out for years about the subject no one was interested in. Another non-fictional account, this time on the issues of his obsession with self-signification and with escaping anonymity. Even as I walked from hall to hall, floor to floor, building to building, feasting my eyes on the colorful array of books from all over the world and marveling at their variety, as I leafed through their pages, I could see how difficult it would be to make my voice heard, to leave a trace to make sure other people could distinguish me from others. As you can see, he himself does not deny that. Now, this is a comparative account because it's also, uh, it also includes um, Snow, uh, some pages from Snow. This is what he sees himself as a writer clerk, and in many public speeches, he makes it clear about all that. I work seven days a week, from nine in the morning till eight at night. I have the titles of the next eight novels I want to write. I feel myself pitiable, degraded on a day that I don't write. I was at the end of my tether when my first book was published. For eight years, I didn't make a thing. I worked so hard, didn't drink, didn't enjoy life. Now this is from his snow. It was as if I discovered yet another weakness in myself. It was a painful remind reminder that while Kala had lived his life in the way that came naturally to him, as a true poet, I was a lesser being, a simple-hearted novelist, who like a clerk sat down to work at the same time, excuse me, every day. Another quote from Snow. What sorrow I felt to imagine my friend pointing out the building in the distance. Or was it something worse? Could it be that the writer clerk was secretly delighted at the fall of the sublime poet? The thought induced such self-loathing, I forced myself to think about something else. Pavel contemplates in Snow again, in a later uh, chapter, um, uh, the, the expectations that Puff's residents now have upon him, or imposed upon him, after they find out Ka is dead. The protagonist is dead. So, and that's the secret. I already said that before. Alas, I was to disappoint them with my bad stumble habits, my absent mindedness, and lack of organization, my self regard, my obsession with my project, and my haste. What's more, they let me know it. My final slide I oh, look. In and through his novel, this is what I claim uh, tonight, as well as what I have claimed also, uh, of course, is part of my research, two points, particularly summed up here. Oran Pamuk, through and in his novel, Snow, alters or manages to alter the boundaries of his own non-exilic, non-diasporic, in other words, non-worldly identity, by converting the concept of identity into a purple genre, namely autobiographical fiction, the focus of my talk, and thus resides in a magical realm, <coughs> a more diverse second world of his desperate quest. He also succeeds to escape from condemnation to anonymity. In other words, remedies his involved personal dialectic by claiming an individuality of worldly significance for himself in the status of an imagined exile, but also within the framework of imagined existence and consciousness in the Turkish diaspora. <coughs> My math did not do this. It looked a little bit more orderly in my math. Now, the imagined writer, uh, for the sake of an Nicholas, my work in progress. This is a uh, brief uh, biographical information. Uh, the question marks are there, of course, not uh, by accident. I was born in Turkey. I'm not telling you my birthplace, although it is announced in the newspaper as Ankara, Turkey. So it's a secret. 
Uh, I have come to the United States after having lived certain years in Turkey after my birth uh, in pursuit of a PhD. Uh, my country of residence, as well as what I consider to be home, uh, is the United States, and I am a college professor of occupation. What does my birth entail? Again, in rough draft forms, uh, I have some excerpts that I would read for you, with you, hopefully, uh, on my novel to be, or hopeful, novel hopeful. Uh, I have 10 chapters currently. These are the titles of the chapters. I'm not going to read cha excerpts from every chapter. What I would like to point out is my weakness. I have realized um, in, in just the amount of time that I was getting ready for tonight, uh, that my dialogue, that my main weakness is my dialogue in my entire writing. Uh, they lack, there is basically no dialogue. So whatever I had, I, I had figured out to be able to remedy, I have tried to do that. But it's, it's a long work in progress. What else? In every chapter, this is what I intend to do, and I already have incorporated some of them. I begin every chapter, rather, excuse me, with a quote, either one of my poems from my youth and later years, or as well as uh, mature years, but also later years, or a quote to my appeal that I found very appealing from a writer, philosopher, thinker, or just anybody uh, who has said something that was very, very meaningful to me. So that's how I begin and I transition into my chapter, so that you know at least something. There's a plan, but I don't know whether I can. Okay, excuse me. If you allow me, what I would like to do, I don't know, um, Greg, may I speak directly at you? Uh, to you, uh, if we I just let go of the PowerPoint presentation and read my excerpts, would that be fine? Yeah. Um, and so, in other words, let's go back to my chapter titles, um, and every time I will announce um, which chapter I read, I will be reading an excerpt from. This is chapter one, titled "Before Birth: Kuban the Novel." I simply stood in front of him looked him directly into his eyes and told him that I would never marry anyone else if he were to not grant me the hands of his daughter in marriage. Huban remembered time and again the beginning of the story of how her father had pursued her mother toward marital union. How could she forget? He had told the same story so many times since she learned how to communicate through her native tongue. Her father also knew German very well and English to a decent extent. Some of the excerpts may sound to you like they are following one another. Most of them are not following, so um, bear with me. He would, however, let a very critical detail escape his recollection. Namely, the multiple rejections that Huban's grandfather, Baitarbe, Mr. Veterinary, as people refer to him with utmost respect for and particular emphasis on his profession, a rare achievement in those times, had confronted him with, to the point of serious threats one such minor nuance as her father would underplay its significance was the blunt refusal in the form of a high voice statement made by his father-in-law Hofu in an exchange with one of her one of her not so excuse me with one of her father's unsuccessfully negotiating matchmakers. I have no daughter to give to that man. So chapter one, excerpt two. I peeked behind the large wall separating the formal living room from the hallway that connected the family room to the second floor kitchen. And I saw, no one noticed me, but I saw. There was his arm, so dark, so hairy, and skinny. Even his hands were covered with the same dark skin and much hair on the fingers. I started crying. Then I ran onto the top floor, into your mother's bedroom, the one with the small balcony overlooking the vegetable garden. And I began to scream onto the balcony, or so I thought later on. Is my best friend really about to marry this unbelievably ugly man? Your mother had no idea as to why I had become hysterical. She was just so very excited and happy that she was now being promised to her future fiancé. I kept thinking, but she only met him once in her father's office. We were both barely eighteen. Auntie Hickman's story, too, was for Huban as familiar as that of her father's. I hope I'm reading or my reading or my tone and my voice are distinctive enough that I make, that I make it clear 
and one is a direct speech, of course, the, you know, the protagonist remembers, and then the other ones are just narration. So that's what I'm doing throughout my novel today, hopefully, or hopefully work. Uh, I have two narrators, very boring, not an exciting as Orhan Bobo. Not that this talk was supposed to be in any comparison or contrast by any uh, means, but I have an I narrator, I have a third person narrator. I am occasionally blending in my own voice and through you know, certain poems that I <coughs> quote or cite at the beginning of some of my at the beginning of all my chapters in my native tongue. That's basically so far, uh, and I'm definitely open for ideas. Chapter one, excerpt three. With his birth weight of close to ten pounds, his simply beautiful, unwrinkled, and white face and fully developed body, and gorgeously bald head, I was no contest to my brother, who was ahead of me in arriving here. Either my older uncle or my father confessed to me at some point in my early years, only after everyone in my immediate and extended families witnessed that I had, for good grown out of that ugly, hideously hairy and skinny girl shell of mine, how with a soft and almost muted utterance. My mother had greeted me when I was placed into her arms the first time. Oh, my unfortunate girl. Having very recently lost her still very young mother to ovarian cancer, sadness must have visited her with compounded severity, resulting from the fear that her underdeveloped female new birth may already be facing the same fate as she herself is bound to face, as was morbidly predicted by her female cousins, whose mother had also died of the same cancer type. If their prediction would come true, my mother must have dreaded to think then her helplessly tiny and weak daughter could not escape the tremendous loss she was facing at the time. My poor, unfortunate mother. The namesake of her poor, unfortunate girl came to my mother during her pregnancy with me, disguised as the title of a newly published novel. She would read again and again, not being able to move herself from under the impact of the novel's narrative, a tragically and how could my mother have known how closely her own poor, unfortunate girl's life was to resemble that of her namesake protagonist? Chapter 2. Utrus, First Love, First Chance. Good solution then. I'm sorry, you have the English translation. I decided to keep my, uh, my native tongue. And um, I haven't completely decided how, to, how I would like to pursue but this is more close to me emotionally. Günsen için de deniz, karşımda sarı sepoz alırken, sensiz olmanın öldüresiye acısı, yerleşiverdiği hangi geçme, uzaklardan hafif hafif esintisiyle, rüzgar arkadaş gibi fısıltılarla, hep hep olmazın en Ma, I resented myself day in and day out for too many years for not having listened to my inner voice. I regretted not having had the inner strength, your kind, to stand firm on my initial intent, to give in to my instinct. You thought that this arrangement was the best alternative that I had at the time. Look, though, look how it all turned out to be. How sad you would be if you were. And when we parted once again, I blamed you, Mom. I blamed you for so long. When I grew tired of resenting myself, I began to resent you. At the time of dusk, when the sea. She should be running home after her regular tea gathering with her friends to comfort me, to assure me that this unbearable hurt will leave me alone soon, that it won't hurt this much ever again. Huban had been crying, no, wailing, all afternoon, on the chair that her mother had decoratively placed right in front of the entry of their large balcony, behind the lacy curtains that her it was getting dark. Her eyes were stuck on the street from where her mother would be approaching their home, beyond that, behind that very tall, ugly building with numerous small shops on its ground floor. When they had first moved to their apartment, theirs was the only one standing in that neighborhood. But now, there were too many, blocking the view from their living room, even the main balcony. What was taking her so long? She knew, sorry, what was taking her so long, she thought. She knew that today was the day when she was going to break up with Utrus.
I read the uh, Turkish and you can talk about the English and I'm, so, I'm sorry for these notions. I work with the man, that's what it happened, otherwise I am perfect print out. Güçlük içerisinde, yeni güne gözlerimi açıyorum. Sık kullandığım koltuğun gene boş kalacağını bile bile. Yaz takılı yalnızlığımı paylaşırcasına. Deniz bile kara bulutlara sarılmış. Büyülü mavisinden sıyrılmışcasına. Tüm cıvıl cıvıl renk nüanslarını terk etmişcesine. Kim bilir, belki de üzerimdeki tatla şefkat dolu gözlerimi kıskanç. Hoban began to write her mother's return scenario. 7 p.m. Better time, snow on the streets and on the roads. Traffic, for sure. Perhaps too much of it. She would take a cab, though. Why isn't she home yet? Chapter 4, Excerpt 1. Marriage, the Continental. And here I have a quote from Bryce Courtney. I had become an expert at camouflage. My precocity allowed me, can away on like, to be to each what they required me to from his power, the power of one. The train station. They were already there. Even if the ride were to take much longer, Kuban would still have to be. Everything was arranged. Tickets. The accommodations for their overnight stay with the relative. The flight they would have to take from that city quarter, the closest to the international airport. The friend to pick them up from their final destination. Another friend at whose place to spend the first week. The arrangement for a long-term university housing after that. Every detail was in its place. The crossing over the ocean could begin. Their first time. Their goodbyes. You may go, but never make it back. You may come back, but find never again what or who you had left, just as the saying goes in Turkish. How often had she heard this song of farewell? Every time associating difficult separations with others. Complete strangers. It was now something that she just wanted to stop bringing. It was time for her to leave now, her most trying separation ever. Wasn't it a promise, though, that she had made to herself to come back before too long? Tamo's face, one that wasn't letting Kuban, Kuban in on the actual emotions he had been going through for the last several months. But especially that night, his dear sweet face with its continuously smiling eyes mischievously curled lips, shapely nose and ears, and a full head of dark curly hair, with very handsome eyes, was to edge itself into her mind and heart for the next decades to come. Take good care of yourself. Go now. Just leave. I must be hearing it all wrong, my thought. Didn't Tamo instead say, stay? Please stay. Everything will be again as it was before. Please just stay. Their train was to leave on time. When was he going to shout, stay? Please stay here. Stay with us? Nothing. A murmur. Barely plausible set of sounds. Take care of yourself. We'll fight to one another. The first siren was quiet enough, Huban thought. Not loud enough for me to act as if I heard it and must act upon it. She could have easily missed hearing this one, missing the train. But then came the second round of warning to depart at a much stronger frequency. Passengers to be began to move away in tears from their accompanying crowds, also in tears closer and closer to the real cars. Then the other set of words that had come through Tamil's lips overwhelmed her. Those unconvincing utterances. Then he told her against her secretly growing desperate wish to hear the very opposite. He's good for you. He will be good for you. All will be fine. You will learn to love him. It happens, and that will happen to you. Kuban shivered, almost uncontrollably. What seemed to her to be too long of a time span after they were seated into their very poorly cooled rail car, she was still shaking. It was a pleasantly warm night as it was always in Dolija this time of the year, with no touch of coldness in the air. Then a sudden burst of heat flashed over her, which they soon found out to be due to the, tra to the train's malfunctioning system. Regardless, Huan was still shaking in violent shivers. When opening the window didn't make a difference in the now almost unbearably hot compartment they would be sharing through the night and most of the morning, hot to anyone else but to Huban, that is, others headed with the eagerness of a newly wedded husband to the door. Chapter 5, The Mother, Death. Ölüyorum, artık bu bitsin. The door closed with force from the draft of the windy early May air. Breathing in from the open window into her mother's lonely, sterile room, open to what seemed to be the longest corridor of the 
husband, one that was to take Kuman out of that high school building into the train station. On her way to her overseas move with Alas, her husband, a man whom she barely knew, whom she had married 10 days ago, after being introduced to him by one of his colleagues a mere handful of months ago, and having since known him in a highly restricted man and woman exchange. The sudden sound, sound of the door shut behind her was going to become a recurring reminder of extreme sadness, but also confusion that she would force herself not to remember throughout her days. If only she had known that evening were to be the last time she was to hear her mother's voice, smell her, hug her, caress her rapidly disappearing hair, touch her still amazing beautiful face, kiss her, take in the undecipherable look of those remarkably beautiful dark green eyes that always knew how to find her one soul. With her mother being able to respond to her embrace in full consciousness with whatever was left from her strength one last time. Her mother's hand in hers and her questioning eyes on her face and body, seeking an answer for the level of her happiness in her few days old marriage. Kuban recounted every step that she had to take before her wedding ceremony materialized. Against her surgeon's orders, her mother had made sure to make her appearance in the cocktail salon where the so-called happy celebration happened. Kuban preferred not to recall any details of that night or any other nights following it. <clears throat> Yet, she pretended that she was happy, especially whenever with her mother, during the time slots the hospital allowed her the short visits, she would put on her happiest possible facial expressions. This act was a follow-up to her initial and repeated attempts to stay behind as an engaged woman only, until after Alas settled in the States to make sure that it was there he would want to pursue his doctoral degree. He could always come back for them to get married, was how Huban tried at different times to convince her mother, who just wouldn't listen to anyone else's conclusions on matters but her own. In this particular case, she had a stronger reason than at other times. Other must had still been living in the flat, right across from Huban's. As with her mother, it was common knowledge in their closest vicinities that the two were very much in love regardless of how final their separation. The same year that her mother died, Kuban would find out from Alas how her mother managed to convince him to make sure that the wedding took place before anyone had left for the States. You're not a man if you leave your fiancé behind. Kuban would discover an even more significant aspect of her mother's insistence for her to marry and leave at once. Her prognosis had in reality been far worse than she and all closest family members pretended to be the case. Specialists had given her less than a year in life at the time of Kuban's wedding date, barely a month before her first surgery. Then came the second, the fatal one. Once again, with Kuban being left out of the grueling specifics until it was too late for her to unite with her mother one last time. Chapter eight, divorce, the Sinop euphoria. It had been a few months shorter than a total of 27 years since I had been to Sinop the last time. My uncle, the only survivor of the eighth generation on my mother's side, made sure that my obsession with that town arrived there intact, long before I personally made my appearance in it. He had arranged for my nostalgia for Sinop poem to be published in the local newspaper. The editor was the son of an old-time acquaintance, in full admiration of my uncle, the physician from Germany, Dr. Bey, Mr. Doctor, as many Sinopians called him affectionately who of the entire desirable world, uh, excuse me, who of the entire desirable world places at his fingertips as retirement destination, had chosen this isolated location, his town of birth. It is not at all unusual for such connections to bear fruit for both involved sites in Turkey, my home country. So I too now was a subject of awe for this man of sufficient publicity power. After all, he knew from my uncle my intent to turn my inheritance over there into a permanent property on which to live through my remaining time. Whether my poem was worth even the slightest effort on anyone's behalf in reading is a question that I answer in negation, says Huban. In stark contrast to the editor, one of the biggest fans of my uncle, the physician from Germany. Either way, along with the product of my attempt at a poetic composition, my story too Thus, it accessed the Sinop locals. With growing curiosity of considerably enthusiastic flavor at that, once it was heard that I was unaccompanied in my trip. 
unaccompanied by my husband, that is. Questions formed, some ever so diplomatically, some quite bluntly. When will Enishte Day be joining you? Enishte is a generic reference to the husband of a sister, aunt, or daughter-in-law in Turkish, and day is like the English mister, only following a name or any noun instead of preceding it. I diverted these intrusions as soon as I learned to retreat to pretense. He has work that he cannot possibly leave. The Turkish Black Sea, in the, still from the same chapter, I'm sorry, uh, another excerpt. The Turkish Black Sea in that region, the country's only peninsula, is often described in slang as a capricious woman because of its reactions to the rapidly changing weather conditions, as smooth a body of water in the early morning hour, yet being taken aback by considerably large to overwhelmingly strong waves come mid-morning. No gender-neutral word choice existed in the country's official language as far back as I could research. I had now become significantly more drawn to this linguistic matter for my own circumstances, were imposing themselves upon my interest toward an in-depth inquiry of the views on and the societal treatment of women in Turkey at large. Questions ebbed from, but also then also flooded to my sense of confidence, engraving in me the often repeated biased judgment of independent women in my home country's past and present, as only I had heard, read, and was told about it before I departed from it decades ago. <coughs> my departure had been abrupt due to marriage, a union that would have dissolved as fast as we had formed it, if we had stayed in Turkey. Yet, I made it work for almost 30 years. It was over now. It had outlived its due course long years back. I chose to prolong it for reasons I neither elaborate nor deny. What I needed at this critical point, turning point was to get my nerves together. In order to honor my decision to exit my marriage, one that had been in progress of dissolving for about the last 12 years, Every now and then, I relive my brief pre-trip appointment in my lawyer's office back in the States. And when I do, his facial expression of profound disbelief re reappears before me upon hearing my statement. I have been chronically unhappy in this marriage and have been making this fact clear to my husband for at least the last 10 to 12 years. Regardless of how determined I was in pursuing my decision to divorce, I needed and wanted to have time to myself, extended periods of time in the right space, namely my own empty flat, occupancy one. I was desperately craving to be left completely alone. What a poor choice I had made in my retreat destination. Sino, of all the places in Turkey, is one of those distinctly hospitable small towns where everyone seems to know they are the resident and takes genuine and passionate interest in each other's affairs. Everyone means well, of course, or so I am told, but the outcome is, then, that there is barely any privacy to speak of. As an integral element to one such living environment, socializing constitutes, constitutes a special art. I, however, had not traveled for almost two full days to socialize with everyone who somehow heard of my visit. Retreat, wrong geography. And the final slide. I had a tall order from the same chapter. Chapter 8, Divorce, the Sinopian Poetry. I had a tall order, to put it over simplistically, a flat to renovate by having it, having it got in its largest spaces, a research article to finish and to present in Vienna, to start on a new one, to complete reading the doctoral thesis of one of my graduate students, and to prepare for my new courses for the full semester, all within three and a half months' time. The construction was to last a maximum of one and a half months, I had been told, yet the work was done a few short days before my date of departure to the States, having, in other words, lasted almost throughout my entire stay in Sino. And some claim that Turkish people had no sense of time when it comes to scheduled commitments. I felt I had proven otherwise. Mm -hmm. Some Turkish people have a good sense of time when it comes to commitments. I made it within my uh, limit, I hope. Thank you so much. Um, uh, that was it. That was uh, my so-called work uh, in progress. Uh, actually, I have just one thing to share with you. I have asked uh, this last chapter that I have read from, actually, it's not the last chapter, chapter eight. That is my most complete uh, chapter. I have asked a few dear friends to read it. 
and give me their two reactions, give their honest reactions, some of them are sitting here in the audience, I'm very honored to have them. Um, and one of them actually wrote, right, um, uh, I don't have the full quote, I will treasure it forever and ever, and no matter what happens to any of my excerpts. Um, uh, she basically pointed out that um, my intent to leave it to my reader to decide whether it's a memoir or, in other words, autobiography or fiction. That is a question. And that is basically what I have been intending to do from the beginning. So um, uh, she had just read right into it and said that um, it was really uh, some kind of a balance, or it wasn't very obvious, although the, from my close friends know quite a bit about me. So that is something that I'm really uh, aimed at accomplishing, of course, but it's uh, not purely autobiography or fiction. There are certain elements, as I have pointed out, um, with my questions regarding my chapters. And another one, basically, um, another very close, cool, dear friend, basically noted um, her hope for me, uh, on my behalf, that um, my writings will um, somehow uh, generate not only interest, but also encouragement uh, in others who uh, have, uh, have to go through or have gone through similar experiences. But I thank my friends in your presence. I thank you for coming, for listening. This was long enough, but uh, I hope uh, it was somewhat a pleasant experience for you. Thank you again. Thank you for the opportunity. Oh. Are you doing any questions? Oh, yes, by all means. Hi, I have a question. Um, yes. Do you write in your native language or in English, or do you go back and forth? Uh, this is, uh, I write actually, I no longer write in my native tongue, uh, unless it's, I, I dig into my old poems. I sort of jotted certain notes from the past, so they're all in Turkish, German, not in English so much. So instead of translating, I really tr try to just incorporate them into uh, my English context, so to speak. But no, I, I, I conceive of any of my excerpts, if you any of my work, in English anymore. Mm -hmm. yeah. Although I have some poems in German, because I, I teach German, that's why. <laughs> Not that I have you know, those uh, triple languages in my head. So thank you for the question. No, it is a very strange feeling. I know that Sally had brought this up in terms of what other languages uh, <coughs> contribute to our work, um, creative work, if, if, if uh, anything. And I thought about it. I, I think I will have to spend a little bit more time on that. Uh, because Turkish is still, uh, although I have lived here over 30 years, Turkish is still the language that feels most authentic to me. Hence, some of the uh, most emotional sections I really wanted to keep in Turkish. But other than that, I think I will just resort to English. Thanks for question. Yeah. Were you thinking about going back and uh, working dialogue into your narrative portions? Was I thinking about that? Yeah, that's that's what I uh, said. So that is really my biggest weakness. There are many others, but I have barely any snippets, dialogue. I've caught snippets of dialogue there, and the way it's constructed sometimes it they escapes are, attention. They are snippets. They are snippets. so. Uh, I definitely need to accentuate that. I know I am aware of it, and uh, as I said, it's it's a matter of time, really. Uh, in full time teaching UT, it is almost impossible for me to really find some time. This, that I, that is very dear to me. I have quite a passion. But I, I realize it's like, wait a minute, there's an I a narrator and a third person narrator. Where is the dialogue? Yeah, where are the dialogues? Thank you. I, I, I yeah. in in autobiographical fiction. Um, so you have the narrator and you have the I character mm -hmm. and and it's it's up to the reader to determine, yes. um, and you have the author. Right? Yes, exactly. And you have the author. We have you three have, individuals yeah, for sure. You have the author, yeah. you have the yeah. narrator, and you have the the I, I character behind the behind the scenes. Uh, un unless somebody as famous as Orhan Pamuk comes out in his public statements, say says uh, this is there is more to my protagonist than meets the eye. We, we are not supposed to know. That's what autobiography, that's the hybrid genre. In, in other words, hiding, actually giving the writer the opportunity to hide under the, this particular hybrid genre, in between genres. To, what, I mean, hiding is probably not the correct term. I don't, for the lack of a better term, I have to think about that. Why am I thinking hiding? But uh, some of us do not want to reveal ourselves, do not want to expose ourselves uh, of all our experience. 
experiences, although our stories are quite different, right? My story will be very different from yours, even if we, you were to use the same dialogue, you know, the aspects, etc. What I'm trying to say is to um, evolve into a different identity. And that's the that's a not lesson that I've learned from Orhan Pamuk, reading Orhan Pamuk Snow. He literally evolves into multiple identities, although it's a scary in a way because you may think I'm not a psychologist or a psychoanalyst or a psychotherapist, but it is scary at times when you're reading. Uh, I read his uh, Snow first in Turkish and then in English. The English translation made much better sense to me. Mm. Really, the distinction was made. With Turkish, maybe I was too close to home, and I had a hard time distinguishing what is he trying to accomplish here until I, of course, did the research and decided to call it autobiographical fiction, uh, um, uh, excuse me, fictional autobiography of exile. And that was, you know, agreed upon, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You know that, but it is, uh, yeah, it, that is the, that, to come back to your question directly. That is a common trait. You are supposed to have multiple speakers in order to leave your reader in suspense. You know, um, it's like, wait a minute, where does he or he come from? You know, not titles, not characters, names. That that doesn't mean anything. But he is, for instance, Ka. He is his narrator, Orhan Pamuk. Uh, I mean, excuse me, narrator Orhan, and then he, there is himself, and then there are multiple other characters who, con who construct fabulous dialogues. But the point is, whose story are we really reading about? That's what Orhan uh, brilliantly succeeds in. It's like, you really don't know until he comes out and announces, this is my story. You just read my story, or I tried to you know, parallel myself with Carl, my protag protagonist. But autobiographical fiction definitely to stress again what you already answered in your question, that would be uh, the, the dynamics. You know, the and is it published I, as a novel? I mean, it's so no, his, his, yeah. yes, yes. And you, a novel. you publish, what will you publish yours as? <laughs> oh, thank you for that very, um, very kind question <laughs> that shows so much confidence. Um, I may live to see some of the, uh, I really don't have an anticipation as far as my novel being pub ever published, my novel to be, I keep calling but it, will and this is not false modesty, oh yeah, mine will be definitely a novel, mm -hmm. and autobiographical fiction, I would really also uh, try to be representative in my writing of the hybrid genre, because that fascinates me, memoirs is so straightforward, you know, okay, here is, here is I am, here, here am I, you know, this is, Hear my st story. Okay, you know, some of us may have exotic details in our lives, but um, it could be a replica of somebody else's lifestyle. So what fascinates me about this is I really felt myself going into that role. It's like some of the things are, of course, things that I've experienced, or are they? Uh, hopefully, there's a question mark. But then I, I felt like one of the characters, although I don't have any characters, and I don't have any dialogues to think through, but I felt like, oh, myself into that and I feel like hopefully my reader will say if I ever have readers uh, um, they will say hmm is that fiction or autobiography interesting question <laughs> thank you so is it inaccurate to say that autobiographical fiction is primarily therapy for the writer <laughs> <laughs> I mean I think Orhan Pamuk is a perfect example for that don't you say I would say so if we had were to have really similar quests in life? I don't. I personally don't at all. As I try to make the connection as to why I start, I incorporated my work, it was really Sally's invitation. So she said, talk about your work too, whatever you're doing. So initially I thought I would be just talking about that article, academic article, purely. But at the same time, I started really reading uh, Snow through a different uh, perspective, time and again, and saying, this is therapeutic for him. Not only does he attain, that worldly significance, but he, the, his personal dialectic, the involved personal dialectic, or the dualism, or the split, almost, I, I dare, dare I say, split personality that he, you know, displays through the snow. Uh, what is all about that? Actually, it comes to fruition at the end. It's a fabulous novel. He calls that one, actually, snow. That's also particularly uh, one of the things that particularly interested me in this part of the novel. This, special novel, this specific novel, because he calls that, in many of his public statements, my only and last political novel. I, I am into agreement because I know, I read all his other novels, but that's another story. So he calls it my only political novel, and the last one. 
So there goes political you know, nuances, uh, historical issues, religious uh, negotiations, on the platform of cars, a very uh, controversial uh, Turkish town uh, where he has he goes through his protagonist actually. It's like a travel literature too in a way, uh, but he incorporates diasporic existence and consciousness all under imagination and as well as exile, as I said, under the hybrid genre and uh, comes up with something uh, as fascinating as smell, like they say, so as a reader, pure reader. That's how who really picked him apart <laughs> in, in this cycle. That's what he does, the theory, you know, the Mike, Mikhail Bakhtin, uh, George Lucas, it, of course, he is using that uh, is using uh, immense amount of materials to bring something about. Uh, I think that is commendable in that regard. I, I have another one. So, can uh, did I hear you correctly say that you don't have any characters? I have char I don't have many dialogues. Yet. I have okay. characters. Oh yeah. Okay. In fact, um, the, all of my chapters are based on a character. And okay. there will most likely be more um, characters added as I go along, maybe. Uh, the last one would be Jana, Jana's marriage, the continental move, not Huban's anymore, Huban's marriage, the continental move. They sort of uh, intermingle. Okay, That's well, my intent. I guess where I was going with that is can you elaborate as to how much you actually fictionalize in terms of did you take multiple conversations with one person? or multiple people and combine them into one conversation and one event? Did you create uh, events that never really occurred? or uh, Multiple characters into one uh, particular framework or plot, so to speak, if we can call it plot individually. Multiple characters that were combined. So um, in, in, to that extent, I fictionalize the characters. But I don't think I have um, achieved the distance, the kind of uh, objective distance that um, we all probably need to achieve, even in, in composing poetry, short poems, it doesn't matter, uh, in terms of um, isolating myself as the person who is yeah, supposed to, uh, again, the so-called writer, the imagined writer in them. Was that an answer to your question, mm -hmm. Greg? Yeah? Thank you for this question. You're welcome. So, thank you for all the questions. I'm wondering, um, it, 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 I'm obviously limited by only getting tiny excerpts of a substantial novel. Um, but uh, you know, I'm interested in, in the plot and only getting like little flashes of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and curious how you are dealing with things in the novel, the actual novel, like um, you you commented about the, the divorce that the, the marriage would have mm -hmm. ended in divorce right away, but but the character decided to keep this marriage going for 30 years. Now that draws me in. I wonder why. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if, with things like that, are you um, coming out and being clear with the reader as to this is why? Or are you implying things and putting a lot of things there? And